Hello and welcome to the final installment of the Meet the Legend speaker series for Google News Initiatives Asia Pacific Youth Verification Challenge for 2022. We're so happy to have you with us again tonight. My name is Holly Knott and I'm here on behalf of Australian Associated Press, Australia's independent and objective newswire service and the hosts of all the Australian and New Zealand events in this challenge. Before we get started tonight, I would like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, which is where I am tonight, but to also extend my respects to the traditional custodians of all the lands represented on this call, on this call tonight, and to offer thanks to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to pay special respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us on this call tonight. So please let me introduce to you Sushi Das. Sushi is the Chief of Staff at RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Assistant Director of RMIT Fact Lab. She's worked as a journalist for more than 25 years and currently leads RMIT Fact Lab's third party fact checking program to combat viral misinformation and disinformation. In 2021, she collaborated with the International Fact Checking Network to deliver some training to journalists in the Pacific region to help them with their fact checking skills. So she is an award-winning journalist who's worked in several senior roles at The Age newspaper and is currently also a PhD candidate researching fact-checking. So she is eminently qualified to talk to you all tonight. But before I hand over to her, I just want to mention that Sushi will be asking you a couple of questions during her presentation. And if you're first to put your answer into the chat, then you'll get a little prize from Google. You'll also win a few points that will give you a head start in next month's verification challenge. So without further ado, let me please cede the floor to Sushi. Thank you for that introduction, Holly, and um, thank you to Google News Initiative for having me here today. Hi, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Australia. My name is Sushi Das, and I'm going to give you an idea of the kind of fact-checking work we do at our two fact-checking organisations. So just a quick overview. One of our fact-checking organizations is called RMIT ABC Fact Check, where I'm the chief of staff. This is a collaboration between RMIT University in Melbourne and the ABC, which is our national TV broadcaster in Australia. Uh, here, the fact-checkers check whether politicians are giving people accurate information or not. And we know politicians do twist the truth sometimes. And we call this political fact-checking. The other organization is RMIT Fact Lab, where I'm the assistant director. This is a fact-checking research and training hub at RMIT University. And here, the fact-checkers check misinformation and disinformation that spreads online through social media. And we call that debunking. Political fact-checking and debunking are core parts of what we do because bad information can come to us through all sorts of ways, through the words that politicians speak, through paid influencers, uh, fake accounts, bot activity, and disinformation campaigns by activists to influence politics. And this has all been on the rise since social media made it easy to spread information by sharing it. I wonder if you think that you might have spread misinformation by mistake. Something to think about. All our articles are published online and they're not behind a paywall because we want the public to have easy access to them. We cover a wide variety of topics such as climate change, asylum seekers and refugees, uh, the economy, elections and other political developments. But for the past couple of years, we've really been focusing on one topic. Yep, you guessed it, COVID-19. So the kinds of claims we've been looking at are things like um, people saying that the COVID vaccine wasn't safe when it's as safe as any other vaccine. Uh, lockdowns, people saying governments were using lockdowns to control people when they weren't, uh, that other countries were criticising Australia's lockdowns when they weren't, and ivermectin, P 
people, including some politicians in Australia, were saying that ivermectin was a good drug to give people with COVID. But there's no proper scientific evidence that uh, ivermectin is a good drug to use to manage COVID-19. Now, when we're making decisions about what to fact check, we generally ask three questions. Firstly, is it verifiable? In other words, is the content actually fact checkable? Does the statement or content that we're planning to check contain clearly verifiable elements that are being presented as fact. So remember, you can't fact check opinions. That's just what people believe. It's only facts. So you're really thinking, is there somewhere I can go to get the evidence or data that I need to refute this content? The second question is, is it relevant to a broad audience? Or in other words, does anybody care? <laughs> By which I mean, is the topic of relevance to a lot of people? Is it part of the national conversation? I mean, there's no point checking something if people don't care. And the third question is, what are the potential community harms? In other words, would the community be harmed in any way if we didn't fact check this content? So we're looking at how far and wide the, the information has spread and whether lots of people are sharing it or liking it. Um, and we ask ourselves, could this result in danger to their lives or their health? So to recap, we're asking, one, is it verifiable? Two, is it relevant to a broad audience? And three, what are the potential uh, community harms? Now, I'm going to focus on some fact checks that we did and show you how we did them. In Australia, one thing politicians love talking about is greenhouse gas emissions. In this example, a politician called Katie Allen said greenhouse gas emissions had fallen since 2005. The red flag that alerted us to checking her claim was largely that Australia has an international reputation for not having the best policies for lowering greenhouse gases. Also, Australia exports, exports large amounts of coal and iron ore, so it seemed surprising that Australia's greenhouse gas emissions would be falling. And here's another ex-politician, Amanda Vanstone, who also said emissions were falling. Now, the Australian government keeps lots of official records, including figures on greenhouse gas emissions. These are the most reliable figures we have. To do our fact check, we looked at these figures, which are available online. And at the time of writing the article, we found that emissions had actually fallen over the past 10 years, just like the politicians said. But they had started trending upwards again about four years ago. So that was 2014 at the time. And this coincided with the time when the government had removed a carbon tax. Now, greenhouse gas emissions can be measured in different ways. For example, they can be measured as total emissions, per, or we can measure them as emissions per capita. That means emissions per head of person. When we did the fact check, we found that in the previous year, Australia's total emissions had been rising, but emissions per capita had been falling, mainly due to Australia's uh, population getting bigger. The politicians were choosing only to use the emissions per capita figure, which was falling. So were these politicians right or wrong to use that particular measure? Well, it comes down to which measure you decide to rely on. So we called some experts and asked them, should we be focusing on total emissions or emissions per capita? And they said, seeing as Australia's progress in cutting emissions under its international obligations is measured by changes in 
total emissions, it would be better to look at those numbers rather than emissions per capita. So when we look at total emissions, the politicians were wrong. Total greenhouse gas emissions were trending upwards. And that's the whole story. So we found this political claim to be misleading and that was our verdict. I'm showing you this example to emphasize that whether a politician is right or wrong sometimes depends on which definitions uh, they choose to use or which measures uh, that you use. We call experts, as fact checkers, we call experts not to get their opinion on something, but to ask them to help us examine which definitions or which measures would be the best ones to use. So I'm gonna pause here to ask you to think about a question now. Can you remember which three questions fact checkers ask themselves to decide whether they should check, fact check a political claim or potential online misinformation? I'll give you a little moment to think about it. Okay, now I'm going to give you an example of some online uh, misinformation that we debunked. We saw an article in the Daily Mail newspaper earlier this year about a Chinese ship spying on Australia. And here's the headline. High-tech Chinese warship is spying on Australia and lurking off the western coast in an unprecedented act of aggression, says Peter Dutton. Very concerning. Mm, not very snappy headline there, is it? And here's the photo that the newspaper published of the spy ship in deep blue water. It was spotted off the western coast of Australia. But the newspaper also published a second photo which showed a different ship. This ship, as you can see, is in front of Australia's famous Sydney Opera House. That means this ship is in Sydney Harbour. As fact checkers, we thought, hang on, that's a different ship to the one we saw in the blue water. They were two different ships. And that was the red flag that set us off to fact check this story. The newspaper also posted a link to their story on their Facebook page. And you can see here three pictures in their Facebook post one of the very cross minister, um, one of the spy ship in blue water, and then this other ship in Sydney Harbour. The Facebook post got, can you believe it, 16 million likes, 3,500 reactions, and 1,300 comments. Wow, that's a lot of people who looked at it. And the impression that these photos together gave was that a Chinese spy ship had entered Sydney Harbour without permission and was spying on Australia. So to fact check this, we did lots of searches of photos of ships looking for any kind of clue. We did a reverse image search using Google on the ship in the blue water, and we found that it was near Australia's west coast because lots of newspapers had reported it there. We also did a reverse image search using Google on the other ship in front of Sydney Harbour and we found that in 2019 there were lots of news reports published that showed this ship came from China to visit Australia with the permission of the Australian government. And that's why it was allowed to come into Sydney Harbour. It was a friendly visit. So the spy ship in the blue water never came to Sydney Harbour, but the Facebook post gave the impression that it did. By publishing those two pictures together with a story about Chinese spying, the Facebook post gave the wrong impression that the Chinese spy ship had entered Sydney Harbour without permission and was spying on Australia, and that was not the case. So we published a fact check about it, pointing this out. And you might think, big deal, 
So what if the newspaper was a bit cheeky and gave the impression that a Chinese ship had come to Sydney Harbour and was spying on Australia? Well, it is a big deal if Australians read that story in the newspaper and become fearful and worried about it. This kind of story could stoke fear about China and its intentions. It could even make some Australians suspicious about the Chinese community, and this could cause divisions in society. So you can see what at first might not seem like a big deal could cause real world harm. After we did the fact check on this Facebook post, we told Facebook about it because RMIT Fact Lab works with Facebook to try and reduce misinformation on their platform. Facebook then greyed out the post, and you can see that there, and attached a warning for users that the post contained unreliable information. Facebook also pushed the post lower down in people's feed, feeds and gave them a link so they could read our fact check. But that's not where the story ends. A couple of days later, the Daily Mail wrote to me and said, you're right, we did give readers the wrong impression. We've taken down the picture of the ship in Sydney Harbour that gave the wrong impression, so please allow the post to be visible again. And they had made the changes, so the post was made visible again, this time without the picture of that ship in Sydney Harbour. And because the newspaper corrected itself, we then changed our fact check and told our readers that the Daily Mail had done the right thing and corrected itself after being fact checked by us. And this is the fact check with the headline, Daily Mail acts after being fact checked. As fact checkers, we felt that we had a strong impact and incorrect information was put right which means the public would have access to correct information. And we were quite pleased with ourselves, actually, if I may say so. So just one more question to keep you on your toes. Can you remember what was the simple online tool that we used to debunk the ship story? This should be a nice, easy one. I hope this session has been fun and useful for you. If you would like to keep up with the work we do, you can find us on these links. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sushi, for unpacking some of your work for our benefit tonight some really practical and helpful examples for our participants here. And I think you perfectly underlined the real world impact that fact checking and debunking can have. So thank you again for that. And now we do have some time set aside for questions from, from our participants. So I invite you all to post any questions you might have for Sushi in the chat and we'll relay them on your behalf. But to get the ball rolling, Sushi, can I ask you how much crossover is there between working as a news journalist, which you've done extensively, and working as a dedicated fact checker, which is what you're presently doing? Well, um, there's quite a bit of crossover, actually. Um, news journalists and fact checkers um, often use similar skills. Um, they both have to make accuracy their main aim. Um, they always go to primary sources when possible. Uh, fact checkers generally tend to only go to uh, primary sources. And uh, daily uh, news journalists and fact checkers um, also need to be able to know how to interview people, how to take good notes, how to understand an issue quickly. Um, but there are um, some key differences as well between uh, news journalists and fact checkers. For example, as fact checkers, we don't use anonymous sources we always name who we speak to, and that builds trust with our readers. So we don't really have um, off the record conversations with people, everything we do is on the record. And also, we don't always work to very tight daily deadlines like news journalists do. We uh, take the time we need 
to investigate an issue and uh, get it right. So we as thorough as we can possibly be. So lots of crossover, lots of transferable skills there. Um, I think there's good lessons on both sides. Uh, when you've been, when you've worked as a fact checker and a journalist, there's good lessons to be learned in both camps that are helpful in general. Um, but we do have a question from Christo in the, in the audience tonight, Sushi, who's asking, whose place do you think it is to decide what information we see on social media? And should private companies like Facebook and Twitter, should they be responsible for that? Or should the government or journalists do that? So quite an interesting topic. I think there's a lot of contention about this. Yes, that's a, a really interesting question and quite a hard one to answer as well. Um, so if we're thinking about who should decide what information we see, I mean, we've got to bear in mind that, you know, companies like Facebook and Twitter, they're private companies and um, they provide a, a sort of service, if you like, a, a platform where people can post things. So it's hard um, for us to, I mean, this is the conversation we've been ha having for uh, quite a few years now. Are these companies just a, a sort of vehicle through which um, information from the public sort of flows in the form of posts? Or are these companies actually publishers um, and should they be held responsible for the things that appear on their uh, platforms? Um, I think that at various times these uh, companies have argued that they are not publishers. Um, but I think um, a lot of people would probably think they are publishers. And the real question is, if they are publishers, then should they be held responsible for what appears on their sites. And I think to some degree, they take some responsibility for that because if there's um, uh, very offensive information on their uh, sites, which contravenes their sort of standards, they tend to take it down. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of misinformation still there. And because we don't know what kind of algorithms they use to assess what should be taken down, it makes the whole, um, being very confusing and muddled. And um, I think these are issues that we as a society are still working through. Um, and uh, hopefully one day uh, we'll get to uh, we'll get to have a, a proper answer to this question. Yeah, that's right. And here in Australia, we're still at the point of self-regulation for the platforms. They're looking at their own content and there are there's an umbrella organization that's supporting them with guidelines to that end but it's still something that's considered by government and I don't think we're at the end of that story yet in terms of whose responsibility ultimately it is and who's going to enact um, you know that those processes to to ensure that those platforms are a safe place and that what's published there is in line with what um, the community expectations are as well as in line with the laws of the jurisdiction where you're reading it. So lots of complicated issues, but yeah, I, I, I would agree with with um, with a lot of what you said just now, Sushi, and, and add that we don't we're not at the end of, of that discovery and that discussion. Um, I do have one more question for you, Sushi. I think that's probably about all we will have time for. But what do you think are the most important skills or qualities for a fact checker to possess? Well, I would say, first of all, um, because accuracy is so important in all forms of journalism, you must be the kind of person who's really careful and wants to get it get things right. So that means you have to be very forensic and, and a little bit on the fussy side with detail. So if you're really, really keen on getting everything absolutely right, um, that's a really important skill for journalists. I would say, secondly, uh, curiosity is a really important um, uh, feature of all good journalists. Um, fact checkers tend to be really good diggers of information, um, and they're like little detectives, if you like, um, and they mustn't um, give up too easily um, and they must understand their society and how it works so you know where to get the information uh, from. Um, thirdly, I would say you really need to be a little bit of a news junkie as well. You need to know what's going on in the news, take a real keen interest in uh, current affairs 
And lastly, I would say it really helps if you're quite a good, clear writer. Um, you've got to be able to write sentences succinctly and clearly without using slang and jargon and be the kind of person who can look at some complicated um, information and make it easy to understand for other people. 100%. All skills that can be learned. Um, so fantastic. Thank you, Sushi, for that. I'll just say Chris O sent a little chat through to say thank you for your perspective on the, on the question that he, that he asked, um, saying at least fact-checking is helping to bridge the gap for now while the, the navigate, um, the navigate this space. Um, but I think that just about brings us to a close so that all that's left for me to do is to thank you again, Sushi, for giving us your time and sharing so much of your knowledge and expertise with us in this forum this evening. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the last of the speaker series. Uh, and so we are now moving into our third phase, which is the verification challenge itself, which will happen next month. And you should all receive some communications about that once you've registered, um, don't forget to register your team. If you've registered to see these sessions, make sure you've registered your team as well. And we really look forward to seeing you all next month where you can put some of the skills that have been shared in this forum tonight and others throughout the month of August. You can put those to the test and see how you measure up against your peers. Um, but thank you again, Sushi, and to everyone on the call, thanks for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks, Holly. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.